Well, good morning. And uh, I don't know how many people know this, but uh, Georgine and our fellowship, it was her 89th birthday this week. And uh, as I was telling Georgine, you know, I said, if we all thought we were going to live as long as we did, we would have took better care of ourselves. But um, it, it is true. And uh, Georgine, happy birthday from all of us. Um, and, uh, you know, ne next year, what, you turn 90? My goodness. Well, we might do that one in heaven, I hope. So if you have your Bible this morning, I'd like to invite you to open them to the book of Luke, chapter 21, Luke 21. You know, we've been going through the book of Acts, but because of what's going on in the Middle East right now, I like to keep everybody as up to date as I believe the Bible will let us to know what's going to happen. Now, the main reason is not so much for you and me, but for people that we run into, there's a great knowledge vacuum of biblical prophecy in the world today. And so many people are so discomforted when they see the news, when they read the papers, what in the world is going on? Jesus said, henceforth, I'll no longer call you servants, but friends, because servants do not know what their master is doing. It's God's good pleasure as his children to let you know about the events in the future. Somebody said one time, well, why are things in the Bible a little hard to understand concerning prophecy? I heard somebody say one time, well, that part was to confuse the devil. Well, I don't know if that's true or not, but one thing I do know is as we see the events of the world unfolding before us, I believe, as Jesus said, look up your redemption draws nigh. Again, if you have your Bible this morning, we're going to look at verse 20 and um, look at some verses here. Now from verse 20 to verse 24, we go from 70 AD to 19. 48, or actually probably 1967, when Jerusalem came back under Jewish control. People have said this. Well, people have been talking about the end of the world forever. What makes you so sure that this time is different than any other time? Well, I'm glad people ask that question because the Bible tells us why this is different and why these things are yet in the future. Because Jesus was very concerned about encouraging people in the last days. Because it's going to try everybody's faith. In trying your faith, you need substantial fact from the Bible to guard your heart. If you don't know what the Bible says about the days we live in, your hearts will fail you for fear. So that's why I believe it is so important that not only we know what the Bible says about the days to come, that it is not a time of fear, but a time of great boldness in a believer's life, knowing Jesus tipped us off, let us know what's going to happen, and therefore we have a message for a lost and dying world. Let's pray. Father, as we go to your word this morning, may your Holy Spirit now come. Fortify in our hearts every one of us, Lord, that we are a chosen generation by you for a specific purpose for such a time as this. And so now, as we read these words, may your Holy Spirit speak to us, encourage us, cause us to remember these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in verse 20, we find that Jesus is speaking about a time in which he had mentioned earlier, as the disciples in the earlier part of the chapter were saying, look at how beautiful the temple is. And this was one of the wonders of the ancient world. They said that this thing had gold plates on the outside and what wasn't covered with gold was white marble. They said from a distance, the temple looked like it had snowed upon it because of the radiance of the white uh, marble that was on it. It was absolutely fantastic. But Israel began and continued to be in rebellion to the Roman government. And we find that when Jesus was on his way to die for us on the cross, he fell under the weight of the cross. 
And the women were crying for him, and he said, don't weep for me, but weep for your children. And when he saw that, when Titus came into Jerusalem, destroyed the city, killed one over a million Jews, took almost 100,000 captive, he saw that day, and he said, weep for yourselves. Now, when we understand how bad this was, that it was completely destroyed. The last building there in 70 AD when Titus came in, this Roman general, burned the city to, with fire and burned the temple. The gold melted, ran into the cracks. In order to get the gold out, they tore the building down and extracted the gold. Well, Jesus said, not one stone would be left upon another earlier in the chapter. And so he says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that its destruction is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee into the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart and let those who are in her country flee from her. Now, first of all, we have a couple of things going on here. By the time the temple was completely destroyed, Jerusalem was pretty much laid in waste. When the Hebrews would read scripture, they would read it with three um, understandings. Obviously what it says, the spiritual application, and its future application. And so we know that Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. And those that didn't get out of the city were murdered. And those that were murdered were taken captive. Jesus said, be careful when you see this, it's time to go. We also know it's going to happen again in the future when the Antichrist rebuilds the temple, or maybe I should say the Jews rebuild their temple. And as their temple is rebuilt, they once again reinstitute their worship of God like they did in the Old Testament. The Antichrist, three and a half years into the tribulation period, goes there and it may very well be at the dedication of the temple, we don't know for sure, but we know that he shows up there, a picture of himself, his name or he himself, and declares to the world that he's God and must be worshiped. Then the world enters the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. Now, personally, friends, from my study of scripture, we're not here. We're in heaven. We're going to talk a little bit more about this in a few minutes as we get a little bit farther into this chapter. But we realize we are a chosen generation. The generation that sees the rebirth of the city of Jerusalem. Not even necessarily the nation of Israel, but Jerusalem in particular is what's so important and what makes our generation different than any other generation since Jesus wrote these things. Now, if you don't understand what's going on right now in the Middle East with the war, the shelling of Israel, and Again, you have Hamas in America as well as all around the world screaming from the mountains to the sea. What they're saying is scrape Israel off and make it like it doesn't exist. What is motivating people of such hatred? Personally, friends, I believe it is the devil. Now, let me explain why. The devil knows God's word to a certain point. We remember when Jesus, after he was baptized, he began his earthly ministry. The Bible tells us in the book of Luke that he was led by the spirit up into the wilderness and there he was tempted by the devil. Now friends, what's unusual about this is the spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. To me, that's almost, <clears throat> almost an oxymoron. Why would the Spirit lead you into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? Friends, I believe that again, it is never for God the Father's knowledge when we go through a test. It is to show us where we stand with our relationship with God. God already knows everything. He doesn't learn. I like that about God. 
Even in spite of all of our failures, he still knows we're going to cross the finish line. I like that about God. But we need to know where we're at. And it's not that Jesus really had to know where he was at, but he had to put the devil in his place. The devil knows a little bit about the Bible. In fact, he said to Jesus, the scripture saith, cast yourself down here from the pinnacle of the temple, for it is written, the angels will bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone, as he quoted out of the book of Psalms. Now, what's interesting about that, this is one of the places where we know guardian angels are real. I like to always reassure my children and people that I love that, hey, we do have guardian angels. The angels will bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. But the devil didn't really quote the entire verse right concerning the will of God for our life. Not to be tempting God, but that God, when we're in his purpose, we're protected. The devil knows the Bible. The devil also knows that Israel is a key part of the last day's scenario. I believe this is what motivated Hitler to kill some six million in the uh, ovens of Auschwitz and the others. I believe this is what we find going on today. Because if the devil can wipe out the Jewish race, the book of Revelation, what we're reading about here today, doesn't make any sense. And I believe the devil does this. What would motivate people to support people who attack babies and children and behead them and believe that they are some way serving Allah? This bl blows me away that whatever God this Allah is that enjoys the butchering of babies and children, I would not want to have anything to do with. Because the Bible tells us the God of the Bible is love. And this is how God has called us to live. Do good to those who persecute you. Turn the other cheek, Jesus said. And I believe this is one of the reasons why in these days that we live in, people are not only looking to us for God's word, but exemplifying what Jesus taught about loving one another, taking care of one another, watching for one another. There's always a temptation, believe me, Christians, in every situation to bend the rules. Whether you're in a restaurant and you get a water glass and want to go up and get a Pepsi instead of the water even though you didn't pay for it, cheating on our taxes, whatever it might be, we always know that there is something challenging us for a compromise. It just happens that way. Well, the Bible tells us that one of the reasons why we are different is God supplies all of our needs according to his riches and glory, and we don't have to bend the rules to make it work. God enjoys taking care of you, and not just taking care of our daily needs according to his riches and glory, but taking care of us in an end-time world scenario. So we find here, 70 AD, we find Jerusalem surrounded by uh, the armies of, of uh, the Roman Empire. Now, what is also interesting is it says, for these are the days of vengeance that all things written might be fulfilled. Everything written about the Bible concerning end times, these things are going to come to pass. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more again so you can defend your faith when somebody says, oh, they've been saying this for a thousand years. What makes this generation different than all the other generations? And so it says, verse 23, woe to those who are pregnant. And those who are, have nursing baby in those days, for there will be distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Now, again, we know this is the picture that Jesus presented concerning that time of the abomination which makes desolate there in Revelation. He said, don't even go back into your house to get your coat. And I believe the Antichrist is not going to be globally humiliated when Israel rejects the Antichrist from being God. 
He's going to bring swift retaliation. And um, so he says here in verse 24, And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive to all nations. And this is exactly what happened. Israel was carried away captive in all nations. Yes. And so, carried away captive to all nations. But notice what it says here, and this is the time marker. If you like to underline things in your Bible, mark this, because this had not happened until 1967. In the Six-Day War, they got half the city of Jerusalem in 1948, the other half in 1967. Notice it says, you be led away captive from all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Jerusalem laid in waste for almost 2,000 years. And uh, again, 1948, the United Nations declared Israel to be a nation, and they're there. In fact, the Bible says, who's ever heard of such a thing, a nation born in a day? That's exactly what happened concerning the nation of Israel. And they got half the city in 1948. They got the other half the city in 1967. What does that mean? When Jesus wrote this, it was under Roman control. Then it was completely annihilated in 70 AD and torn down and laid desolate for hundreds of years. And now, today, Jerusalem is a cup of trembling to the whole world. Exactly what Jesus said. That's why I know, that's why you need to know that the generation that we are in is different than any other generation. Remember, Jerusalem is God's pocket watch. It's his timepiece. If you want to know where we're at in prophetic scripture, globally, look at the nation of Israel, in particular, the city of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem is that, is a time marker for us. Now, verse 39, it says, and there will be, sign, uh, there will be uh, signs in the sun, in the moon, in the stars, in the earth, distress among nations with perplexity and the seas of the waves roaring. The word perplexity here in the Greek means problems globally with no way out. Does that describe us pretty good today? Can you point really any uh, thing you, you, in the newspapers, on the news, doesn't talk about a war someplace? Well, notice he says, men's hearts will be failing them for fear of the expectation of the things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. I believe this is the second coming of Christ because, again, when you see the end time scenario in the book of Revelation, the whole world is literally destroyed itself. In fact, the Bible says, unless those days were shortened, there'd be no flesh saved in Matthew chapter 24, kind of speaking about the same thing that we're reading here. And we see that. We see that the tribulation probably would have went a lot longer, but because of man's technology, the ability to destroy himself, hey, listen, we're running out of time. So he says, now when these things begin to happen, begin to happen, look up, because your redemption draws near. There's a redemption that happens apart from God's global judgment on the earth. And I believe this is why this is so important. As Jesus said, behold, I come as a thief. Now, thieves are sneaky. And they want to come when you're not around or when you're asleep. These kinds of things. But Jesus said, you're different. You know when I'm coming. The world hasn't got a clue. But you as believers know when Jesus Christ has given the signs of his coming. Jerusalem now is under Jewish control, just as Jesus said it was. The shift from God dealing with the Gentiles is going to go back to the Jews. 
Daniel in the Bible, in the Old Testament. His nation of Israel, he was a person who knew God. He loved his country, and yet they were carried away captive to Babylon. And there in Babylon, Daniel cries out. This Jewish boy carried far from his home as the nation of Israel was smashed and conquered. And Daniel cries out to God, and God sent an angel to speak to him and said, Daniel, don't be troubled. For 77 year periods of time have been determined upon your nation of Israel. In the 69th year, Messiah will be cut off and the time will stop. There's a seven year period of time in which God will deal with the nation of Israel and then all the things concerning human beings will be completed. Well, we find in 69, 69th year, that's when Jesus was crucified on the cross. They rejected their Messiah and God stopped the clock. But God says, I'm going to start the clock up again and as he said, they will look upon the Son of Man and they will weep as they would weep for an only son, the very Messiah that they rejected. They'll realize the time of their visitation this time and they will accept him as their Messiah as he comes back to set up his thousand year reign here on this earth. So now he says, look up, lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. And he spoke to them a parable and he said, look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you likewise, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will no means pass away till all things are fulfilled. The generation that sees Jerusalem back under Jewish control. Now remember, when Jesus said this, Jerusalem was under Roman control and then wiped out in 70 AD and it lay desolate. Jesus said the generation that sees Jerusalem is the last generation. Friends, I believe that's us. So you wonder what's going on when you see things in the world, when you hear Putin, again, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, he was saber rattling again, and now China is saber rattling against the United States. Causes a little bit of concern being that as we study scripture, the United States is really not in biblical prophecy. So I've got to say very well be that the coming of Jesus to take his church home, known as the rapture, is sooner than we may know. He says this, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words by no means will pass away. Jesus is saying, look, again, the generation that sees these things will not pass away till they're all fulfilled. So where does that leave us? I think that's a fair question. What, what manner of people then should we be? Well, I'm glad because you asked that question. Verse 34, let's look. But take heed to yourselves. Now, when you say take heed to yourselves, that means watch out what you're doing. Notice he says this. Lest your hearts be weighted down with carousing, drunkenness, the cares of this life, and that day come upon you unexpectedly. Wow. Wow. You mean I could be so carried away with things that I would miss a certain day that Jesus is speaking. And we're going to see here in the next couple of verses what this particular day is. Now, again, when you read Revelation, uh, the very end of the tribulation period, right before the second coming of Christ, where the Bible says every eye will see him, he splits the skies and everybody knows that Jesus is coming back. That can't be talking about this. Because you see, the thing is, the second coming of Christ, every eye sees him. Jesus comes to the earth. The rapture of the church is where we go to meet him in the air. There's a big difference. 
Now again, <clears throat> he says, for it will come as a snare upon all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Now, a snare. A snare is something you're not aware of. Remember when you were a kid and you always tried to catch a bird, you put the box up with the stick and you put a, you know, a Ritz cracker in there and hopefully a bird come along and you pull the stick. I caught a bird. I don't know what we're going to do with the bird. I wouldn't eat it, but we caught one. Uh, we, we thought we'd make a snare. A snare is sneaky. You, you, it's to catch people. Jesus said, I'm telling you these things so it won't catch you. Do you believe it would catch the world by a surprise right now if Jesus Christ was to come and take the church home? I believe it would. I believe they're not looking for the Lord's return. In fact, most people hate God. Why? All God has ever done is try to love people and be kind to people. But look, look at the way they react. Isn't it weird that so much, and I, I would have never believed this about the United States, is that we would have open demonstrations supporting murderous terrorists. It's, it's to me unbelievable. I, I don't understand. And there's a po particular po political party in America that seems to really enjoy the whole Hamas idea. Now, friends, this is a concern to me. This is America, this is a, a, an America that I am not familiar with, that I have watched morph through the teachings of our schools and our colleges to become un-America is cool. And I think we all have seen that. Well, what the Bible tells us is that there is going to be a dynamic global shift against the nation of Israel. There's going to be a global dynamic shift to a one world order and the Bible here tells us it'll come upon a snare. Now, the snare I believe here is speaking of is the Lord taking his church out. That's why you're a chosen generation. You are salt, you are light. Don't forget that. Don't be overcharged with the cares of this world, the drunkenness, the party, and all that stuff going on. Now, by the way, when you go to the very last part of the tribulation period, mere survival is all really the world is able to, to eke out, if you will. Um, but as in the days of Noah, as Jesus said in Matthew 24, were social the coming of the Son of Man be, I believe speaking of the rapture, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, party time, just like now. But the second coming of Christ, not the rapture, the second coming of Christ, the Bible says, Every living thing in the sea has died. All the trees are burnt up. The Bible tells us that the world is literally dying. Not hardly eat, drink, and be merry. A much different scenario. So he says this again. Don't allow these things to come upon you to take your heart away. For it will come upon as a snare upon all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things and will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. I believe this is speaking of the rapture. In other words, that we will escape all these things and that we will stand before the Son of Man. Speaking of we go to see and be with him. Now, Again, that question is only a question that you and your heart know, whether you're right with God or not. You know, a lot of people like to play on the fence. They go, well, you know, uh, at the very last minute, friends, we're at the last minute. How long do we have? Wouldn't it be nice that you would give your life to Christ and the time you have left to lay up for yourself some treasure in heaven? Where moth and rust and thieves don't break through and steal. All those things that take away your reward here on this earth, that you would have a reward in heaven that would last forever. I believe that's so important. I don't want to get to heaven and God look at me and say, well, you made it. I want God to look at every one of us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And God starts dealing out. God starts dealing out the rewards, the crowns for your faithfulness.
That, I believe, friends, is what's so important. Because you get a reward that will never fade away. You trade something for you that you can't keep for something you will never lose. That's a good deal. I always like good deals. Everybody knows that. I, I'm a good deal kind of guy. I just like that. Somebody said, there, there's only thing better than one, one second-hand store, and that's another one next to it. I don't know if that's true or not. But we like deals. But I like eternal deals. And I like to see what will be for us in the future that we haven't been playing on the wrong side of the fence, that we haven't been, as it says here, um, drunkenness, cares of this life, those things that overwhelm us. Sure, we all have jobs we do. We all have things we like to do. That's okay. But if that becomes your sole focus and you leave out the things that God wants you to do, friends, we're missing God's eternal blessing in our life. See, God's got an eternal reward for you. And so he says, watch therefore, pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things. Escape all these things that tells me that there's an escape hatch on the side. What is that? The Lord taking us home. I pray that you understand that the Lord has made an escape. I'm not saying we're not going to go through trials. I'm not saying we're not going to go through temptations. And right now around the world, there are people dying for their faith in Christ. But if the Bible here is talking about something globally that affects everyone, that there is an escape. That escape is Jesus. You know, I want to just encourage you. If you're a Christian, keep going. Take every opportunity you can to let your light shine. Let your heart be seen by, by others that they'll give glory to God in heaven because of your Father that has, has directed you in your life. If you're not a Christian, today's your day. Today's your day. Why wait another day carousing, drunkenness, party time, cares of this life, when you could be laying up for yourself treasure in heaven. You see, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you in John 14, 6. And if I go, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you'll be also. And Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He's not only your escape hatch, he's your ticket to get there. The Bible says if we'll confess our sins, he's faithful, just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Today's your day. This is the time. Jerusalem is under Jewish control hadn't happened for almost 2,000 years, or actually 2,800 years. And now we find the war that's battling in the Middle East, exactly what the Bible says. Are you ready to go? Feeling a little weightless? Are you looking for the upper taker? Don't be in the ground with no one else around. You won't rot in your plot when you see what we got. You see, God's got a plan for you. And you know, you'll never know what that is until you surrender. God's the perfect gentleman. Yeah, I, I always think that's interesting in Revelation chapter three. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. I, he, he's a gentleman. He knocks and waits for us to respond. Um, he doesn't stand at the door and kick it off its hinges. He knocks and waits for us to respond. Remember, God has always made the first move. It's up to you and me to make that, that uh, invitation a reality in our life. This morning, if you've never prayed and asked Jesus into your life, today's your day. All things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Your sins are forgiven. The line of communication with God has been reestablished, and now you can be about your Father's business. And that great anticipation of that day the Lord takes his church home. What makes our generation different? 
than any other generation. Jesus said this, Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles till the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. It is under Jewish control. It is the capital of Israel. Wake up. We are in the last days. I like that. It's not something to be scared of. It's something to go, wow. He's coming as a thief, but I know, I know the game. You know the game. But for the world, they don't. Every opportunity. You know, we have this thing coming up this weekend. I am not doing this just so kids can have an ample supply of candy to rot their teeth out. We're doing this so people come, and then as we are there with the people, hey, man, you know, well, that's a pretty good-looking costume you got there. What are you? Oh, I'm a giraffe. Wow, well, that's really cool. Hey, I'd like to invite you to church tomorrow. You know, people are looking for answers. There are no answers in the world. Like, there's no answers in Congress. But there's an answer in Jesus. And that's what we want to point them to. Being about our Father's business. So important. If you're not a Christian, we're going to pray. And people have often asked me, why do you do this at the end of every service? Because I would rather have, have given everybody. In fact, I, I tell people this on the radio too. I go, are you a Christian? And they say, yes. And I say, well, I would rather ask and have you say yes than not ask and have you said no. I always want to give people an opportunity to change their life. Don't ever be scared of that. You know, it's really funny. Years ago, I wasn't a pastor of a church. I wasn't anything. Uh, I, I just was just a, a kid in high school, but I love God. And I remember a friend of mine came over to my house, and we were talking. And I just said, well, do you want to pray and ask Jesus into your heart, automatically thinking he's going to say no? And he said, yes. And he prayed and asked the Lord in his heart, and he's still walking with the Lord today. And I think about that, and I go, that is so weird, because the devil always say, they're, they're not going to say yes. You'd be surprised how many people are just looking for something to change their life. Just something that will give them truth, give them what's really going on. The Bible has all those answers. Again, who would ever dream that Jerusalem, after laying waste for almost 2,000 years, would now be a most fought over city in the world. You see, that's the God we serve. God is good. And I want to just encourage you, if you've never prayed and asked Christ in your life, we're going to pray right now, and you can ask the Lord in your life. Let's pray. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. And I repent of the foolish way that I have lived. From this day forward, I commit my life into your hands. I believe you died on the cross for me and you took my sins away. So write my name now in your book of life that I can live forever with you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me the boldness and the love that I need to live each day. And I give you all the glory Make my life mean something now in eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. You prayed that.